Th these are on. Great. So as you can see, these are powerful films of uh, kind of empowerment, of people struggling for empowerment, of people overcoming obstacles or not always overcoming obstacles, and uh, really looking to make a mark on the world and, and succeeding in making that mark. And, so, and, and what's great about it to me is just seeing the diversity of it, of these different kinds of films and seeing the diversity of, of talent behind the camera and in front of the camera. It's, it's extraordinary and it's uh, you know, so great for the DGA to be honoring these directors in these films because it really is something that reflects the world we live in. And I think that's, that's just a great thing for us. Um, and the three directors here all have really different kinds of backgrounds. And how you got to be a director is sort of an interesting thing here. So I'm gonna start with you, Angela. We all know you as a, uh, extraordinary actress and you know who's embodied every from Tina Turner to Rosa Parks to Katherine Jackson but how did you make the transition to uh, of course what we love as directing um, well I had been asked years is this on many many years ago you know to direct maybe an episode of a you know of a show of it was uh, soul food but then I get an acting job. And so, you know, and I was intimidated because I have such respect for the directors that I've worked with. So I said, that's just incredibly hard job. And I can just think about my one little character. So I got an acting job. It's like, oh, okay. I did make the, I made the choice to go back into, you know, what I love and comfortable in. But I was always intrigued with that idea and very thankful that I had been asked to do it. But I didn't think that, you know, I hadn't studied or thought, you know, that was, could maybe handle it. Um... And then I was asked to do another little short, but I didn't feel compelled by the story. You know, again, it was like, oh, wonderful opportunity. But I think the first time out, it has to be something that I'm really, really passionate about because I imagine, you know, I know all the hours it takes to think about a character, developing a character. Now, what if you're the, you know, the head of this, this ship? You know, right. you got to think about all the characters and a slew of other things as well. So I said, no then. So, and then I thought, well, then I tried to direct my own piece, you know, raise money to do that, <laughs> but I didn't have any background. So trying to, you know, encourage people to give me money, have faith yeah. in me that I can do this, that was like an uphill struggle. So this one particular day, I worked with um, a producer with Mary J, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. on Betty and Coretta, and we had filmed it in, you know, in Canada, in Montreal. I had a great time. The producer was wonderful, Larry Sidnitsky, and we we kept in touch. And you know, every you know, four, five, six months, we you know get together for lunch or whatever. And he said, and of course, the inevitable. What are you up to? And he tells me, you know, on the QT that he's going to produce this movie about Whitney Houston, and I was stunned. And usually I just think whatever thoughts I think and, you know, and go on. But out of my mouth came, oh, I wish I could direct that. <laughs> you know, he hadn't found a director. You know, you're like, how's it going? And so I just, like, uttered this without, not purposeful, like, you know, like, hint, hint, or anything like that, but just so wistful. And uh, he said, and he, you know, he was stunned. He said, uh, you want to direct? And I said, well, yeah, you know, because, you know, all these many missed opportunities or, or opportunities that I said no to. And, um, you know, went on with the lunch and date maybe about three or four days later, the phone rings and it's him. And I, I'm just busy. I'm, you know, at the time I'm flying, my mother's ill. I'm flying to Florida. Everything's pulling and, you know, kids. And I, and I said, okay, let me answer the phone, you know. And he says, you said you want to direct. Do you want to? because you can. And so it just sort of dropped like that. And then I said, uh, well, can I read the script? <laughs> script. <laughs> yeah, because she, you know, she, she, yeah, yeah, that, that's one thing. Yeah, exactly. You know, she meant so much. And it, it, uh, it was going to, I knew it was going to be scary, frightening, new, all of those things. But also having a, um, you know, a working relationship with Whitney years ago and just the way I feel about her, the way we feel about her, felt about her as artists and community and, um, I need to read the script. And then 
I see if, if I, uh, you want to fight lions with a switch. Because yeah. that's what I felt it was going to be like. <laughs> but worth it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you did a good and, job. Yeah, great job. And, Lori, so you, your background is more in documentaries. and, and or well, That's how I started. Put, yeah. I've only made one, actually. I, I, and I actually was nominated for DGA Award for that film, New York Can Dream. And it was my thesis film for NYU. And I, at that time... NYU, I don't know, it's probably changed over the years, but it was very um, ivory tower, and they didn't really, they taught us all about, you know, the art and craft of filmmaking, but nothing about the business. So I didn't even really know what the DGA was <laughs> when I got that. I was like, uh, but I was developing my script for Sherry Baby in, in France, so I couldn't come. But anyway, I've only made one documentary, yeah. but I have that kind of a brain, so I think it informs this work that you just saw. And everything I do, really, because I'm always like trying to get the truth, the, the details, uh, the factual details correct, and um, it motivates me a lot. And especially in terms of Marilyn Monroe, because there have been 600 biographies written about this woman, so a lot of them conflicting. Surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> we based our script. Um, Stephen Cronish wrote the script. He based it on one biography called The Secret Life of Marilyn Monroe. Um, but I read several and, and things came up during the process where I was like, well, in real, you know, we just um, use what, you know, it was like doing detective work. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the prep uh, was doing the detective work to just try to get the most, like I learned that her foster mother slash aunt slash mom's best friend played by Emily Watson, okay. We learned, you know, during that period that she was an alcoholic. That's not in Randy's book, but I thought, well, that's kind of important. So mm -hmm. you see it in these scenes, the clip, you know, she's always got a drink and just little things like that. But I really do believe that details tell a story. So, yeah. And and Matthew, you and I, we started back in the day. Yeah. In, don't, don't say when. I wasn't going to say when, but we were <laughs> we were working for Lincoln Center, teaching teachers how to deal with Matthew dance and, and music, and I was doing theater, but it was a long time ago, and you were a dance, excellent, by the way, dancer, choreographer, and uh, how did you get to this? Um, <clears throat> my path briefly was that I, I, I started as a dancer, it was, might have been in a prior century, yeah. and uh, then I became a choreographer, sort of the natural outgrowth, then at one point, I was sort of fairly deep into my choreography career, and I just thought, this is not really right for me, I, I felt very limited by the tools. I kept thinking, why aren't these people speaking? They can talk to each other. And so I had a dance company at the time, and I disbanded the dance company trying to find a way to, um, to direct. I mean, it's like, I, I feel so stupid, because like, what I always wanted to do was direct. That's yeah. so cliche. But I, um, through my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, um, I met the people on Guiding Light. And I kind of wangled into what I'd never heard of, which was observing. Um, now it seems so common that people shadow and observe and all that. I'd right. never heard of it. They were like, come and, I don't know, stand in the back for a while. And I did, and after a while I kind of convinced them to let me shoot a half a show and, or a scene, and that went well, and so half a show and a show, and um, in the, you learn in the daytime world. It's, it's an unbelievable, it's trench warfare. It's, I have beyond respect for that world. Um, because you are knocking out sometimes 100 pages a day. I mean, 125 pages a day. Well, the whole machine is geared up for that. Um, and I was very fortunate. I had fantastic uh, producers and other directors to learn from. And then I left there at the end of my contract. I came out here. I've, gotten, I've got, been very, very fortunate. I'm the luckiest guy in the room, I promise you. Um, but I've gotten to work in a lot of arenas. At the time, sitcoms were in their first really gigantic heyday, Family Ties, Designing Women, um, Golden Girls, et cetera. So I got to direct a lot of those. I got over to single camera, and I directed quite a bit of single camera, um, uh, episodic, and a few TV movies. Not like this kind of TV movie, which is different. And then uh, I also, because of my dance and music background, I was asked to direct um, some of the uh, Dance in America, a producer named Judy Kinberg, who is a wonderful producer, called me up and said, I understand you speak both dance and television. And I was like, yes, I actually freely translate. He said, great. And so I started shooting um, uh, the Dance in America and then soon musicals and music specials and 
it just I've gotten to work in a lot of arenas. And then what kind of led to this was exactly that is, you know, they, um, Bob Greenblatt, who my respect for him is enormous, decided three years ago, as we know, to stake out this area of putting a live musical back on television. And then, you know, I watched Sound of Music and Peter Pan, which were both wonderful. And I thought, okay, well, I'm just not in that world. And then one day a text arrived. I was literally waiting to get a, uh, it's a good thing I was in the doctor's office. I was waiting to get a travel checkup. And I was like, oh my God, the, the offer was in the phone. And, uh, but I went to meet Kenny Leon, who was my co-director. And it's, it's this rare situation uh, uh, that the Directors Guild has sanctioned where there's two directors in the room. The rule is one director in the room, period. They fire that guy, fine, get another guy, but it's one. And this is, I think, maybe the first situation, unless you're an established group like the Hudlin Brothers right. or the Coen Coen Brothers or something. Coen Brothers. Yeah, there's a few where there's two directors. And Who so aren't brothers. Well, now we, you know, now we're very good friends, obviously. Um, and the way I kind of ex uh, expressed it to um, Bob Greenblatt, and he agreed, is their theory is the job is so gigantic to put these musicals up, up at all, because the first night, which should be your Broadway preview, you go live for the entire planet. That's by itself very tough. Now you're supposed to shoot it. And so I kind of, the way I put it is you get the guy who's won the Tony, to stage the play, and you got the guy who's won the Emmys to shoot the movie. Um, so Kenny Leon is, was my co-director, or whatever you want to call it exactly, yeah. and it's a unique situation, which I found very satisfying, very exciting, and you know, unique even in my career. Yeah, I'm sure. So, so, and yours was the only one of these that was not a true story, as far as we know, um, <laughs> and but. In th and having done a number of true stories, I know there's something really tricky about it, and this is sort of for, for Angela and then Laurie, is that you, you feel, and I'm sure you guys with gigantic humans who are a part of our, our culture and our consciousness, do you feel a fidelity to, to who they are and to the facts, but isn't there also a kind of thing as, as you're telling stories, you're doing narratives, that you have to... You know, how do you come to grips with bending the facts to, let's say, get at the truth? And, um, you know, I, I guess that's the question. How do you, there's a scene, for example, in, uh, in Whitney where uh, Bobby Brown tells Whitney that he's made someone else pregnant. And they have this spectacular fight that goes all through the house. And it's this wonderful scene, but uh, how, do you, how do you come to grips with scenes like that where, you know, She's not around. We don't really know what happened. And how do you, how do you as a director, approach that? Um, well, looking at other things that are around, you know, that, you know, Bobby was, he was, you know, he had his, his weaknesses, his flaws, but he wasn't a liar. He was, he was honest about his situation and about his past, you know, about his children. You know, he's he hasn't hidden that. He was, you know, very open, very loving about that. And how she also came to accept them and to love them and to, you know, and they were always welcomed in her life, you know, blending that family. Her daughter, his daughter from another they were they were they were close. So I imagine that they must have had a conversation about it. And, you know, we don't know where it, you know, where it actually happened, but you can assume that it did happen because of the way they lived their, their, you know, you know, things that we saw in their life later of the family being together, even if you watch the, you know, his reality show. Right. Yeah. Um, um, and so we have this set piece and just trying to find, because so much of, a lot of it was in the house, but then it, so it was trying to make use of the house in different, you know, put them in different places, okay, the foyer, uh, you know, trying to get movement, you know, so they're just not, t you know, talking yeah. heads. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, having worked with Whitney, I, I, I just felt a real commitment and charge and responsibility and weight to, um, to, not, to not judge her, you know, to not judge him, you know, um, especially knowing how history and word and talk and chatter and, and all of that, but um, to really um, um, try to 
you know, peel back layers of what a relationship is. Yeah. Well, he's is. very sympathetic in the film, and you can see that in the, the clip that we saw, the love story gone gone wrong. Yeah, yeah, I was, I always would say I had a hard four for that character and for, and for him, you know, it was, uh, and I came ha having, I mean, there were, through the years, within the last 10 years, I mean, meeting him on the set, having worked with her, as I said, and then him visiting the set, and me having my, you know, as an audience, as an observer, mm -hmm. as someone outside, having my preconceived notions of, from the outside looking in, and then being a fly on the wall, actually being on the set, sitting there with her the day he comes to visit her, and and sitting there with them, and then how all that was was changed mm -hmm. in that little moment. And then years later, running into, you know, on a flight with him, and the interaction, and the way he, you know, dealt with me and spoke to you. So it was as if I had, you know, just another perspective that I wanted to bring. Yeah. And unless they say you only get a, you know, first time, first time, he made a different impression, on, you know, on me. Sure. So I want to bring what I experienced to to the story, to the telling. Yeah. Now, Laura, you didn't have, you didn't, didn't meet Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe or Joe DiMaggio, I don't think. When this, when my manager told me that I got this nomination, my first thought was, oh, Marilyn liked the movie. Yeah. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. I felt very close to her. I did a lot of, you know, but the, what I was going to say is um, we're not making documentaries, and the audience knows that. So it gives you a certain amount of freedom just going in. You know, you know, you have a story to tell, and how can you fictionalize it in order to tell that story? So with Marilyn Monroe, it's like she's this woman who came from nothing. She was born in the charity ward of the Los Angeles General Hospital uh, to a schizophrenic mother who had to give her up when she was two weeks old. I mean, she had everything working against her. Um, and she rose, you know, to enormous power. And despite, you know, all of the misogyny of the era and um, her own shortcomings, her addiction, and all all of that stuff, she still made this enormous impact. And I still today, you know, walk through the streets of Brooklyn where I live, and I see young people with Marilyn Monroe tattoos on their body, and I'm just like, wow, she's so powerful. How she. So I watched tons and tons of and any any anything with her voice, um, radio interviews, documentaries. There's not much. It wasn't a very TMZ culture at the time. We didn't go behind the scenes of you know the celebrities' lives the way we do now. So there's not actually that much documentary footage of Marilyn Monroe. But obviously studying her films and and juxtaposing them with some of the true life footage. Um, she was also one of the most photographed um, celebrities ever. I think there are over 60,000 photographs of Marilyn Monroe. So I studied those very intensely. And there are quite a few with her different husbands, um, in particular, um, Arthur Miller. He was a bit of, I wouldn't, I don't know him. I, I wouldn't, I don't know Ham, but he, there, he, there, you know, they did posy, coupley photographs, and there was a lot of um, inviting photographers to their homes. So you can also get a lot of information just watching people's body language. You know, as actors and directors, we really have to understand human behavior and fill in those blanks, you know. Like you said, if it's a blended family, the conversation probably came up. Oh, you know, blah, 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 is pregnant. Like, because you understand human behavior, and the same goes for um, trying to get into Marilyn's head. Like, I'm, I'm a woman. I've always been a feminist, and so I understand, you know, these relationships between men and women in a way that, you know, works for my craft. I don't know. And, again, you don't have that pressure um, that you're making a documentary. So, you know, you know. You can you can run with it to more. serve the story. You can. I think it's Werner Herzog has this wonderful quote about like the best way to tell the truth is to tell a lie or something, you know, <laughs> regarding fiction films versus <laughs> docs. Yeah. So Matthew, you didn't have the challenge of. Uh, well, that's actually a documentary. Yes. <laughs> Few people <laughs> know that. So. Yeah, people really wear those clothes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but. You know, here's a show of you know, incredible size. Uh, you, I, I'd love to hear a little bit about just how you and Kenny Leon 
court, you know, made that happen, what your real responsibility was. There was a long, re the rehearsal period you were telling was like from September to December or? Uh, the way the process worked, Kenny was aboard just before I was, maybe a lot before, I don't know, honestly, I flew to New York and met him and we decided we were of the same mind and the next thing I knew I was, you know, I'm on the show. Um, the idea, the, the process, once I got aboard, the process was that um, the, first of all, the concept of the space was very different than Sound of Music and, I mean this, sorry, back up. This form seems to be being reinvented every day right through Sunday night, right through the right. day before yesterday. And believe me, it's gonna change a lot and there's gonna be a lot of it, I hope. Um, Sound of Music and uh, Peter Pan had gone through three or four stages, across three or four stages at the Grumman Studios in Long Island. This time what the idea was was that eventually this is gonna go to Broadway, more or less as is, and how would they do that? And so we built basically a Broadway stage. Picture the stage of the Metropolitan Opera, because it was that size, um, on the Grumman stage. And then we had a wonderful set designer, et cetera. Um, the LED screens that you see in the back, which they change, they, they, they turn and they, they pitch and they, they change all the time and they slide across, they do amazing things. Uh, that was kind of going on. But so the concept for it was progressing all along. Uh, then when we got to, essentially once we got to the rehearsal studio, we used the Brishnikov studios, that was really Kenny's world. I mean, he's staging and working on the performances and blocking it. It is 98% his blocking, except that we go, you know, we're not gonna be able to shoot it like that. You can do this or you can do that. But that's the only way I can see this. And he's very receptive. Um, and then Fatima Robinson, our wonderful choreographer, was choreographing kind of the same thing. It's all obviously her work. Um, when we hit the studio, though, suddenly it, it becomes my world because now we got to put this thing on camera. And then it's like our, I've been watching him about 95% and now he's watching me about 95%. And you know, getting the process of getting this to speed so that one night if in three hours we can sit down in the truck and um, snap our fingers 1,500 times and the show is over. Um, yeah. yeah, that, oh right, exactly. And it's very, very painstaking, detailed work. Uh, um, how many, how many um, let's say, dress rehearsals did you do where you run through it with cameras and then look at your work? The interesting thing for us, uh, my associate director is here, Ray Krause, and she's fantastic. She saves my life on a daily basis. Um, but w the interesting thing is the choreographer, we always complain because the choreographer gets like 10 or 11 weeks, Kenny got about eight weeks, and we had 12 days on camera, because we are really, really expensive. Uh, you know, we, have, we had 12 cameras. We got, it took us three days to put it on camera the first time, and then we did a half a show one day, a half a show the next day, and by around the sixth or seventh day, we're trying to do run-throughs every single day. So we had, I think, four dress rehearsals. Um, the first one, not with timed commercial breaks, the next one's all with time commercial breaks. So that by the time you're doing it, it's all I was saying to everybody is do what you did last night, just better. That's all, it's not much of a direction. And but don't try to do anything new, don't surprise us, our cameraman can't find you, don't go, I have a great idea, I'll run to the stage left, like mm, please don't do that. Um, and, and we had some wonderful experienced hands in the cast. I mean, Queen Latifah was on living, I mean multi-camera hands, which is a little different technique than single camera, like shooting multi. Is there, there's just another skill set. It's not, it's not impossible to understand, but Queen Latifah had done Living Single for five or six years. David Allen Greer's had a couple of series. I had actually done one with him. Um, uh, Shanice, who was brand new, I think she's had two jobs in her life and uh, was a wonderful high school graduate and obviously an incredibly gifted performer, but she's like, cameras? <laughs> you know. Um, but she was unbelievable when we finally hit the screen. But we had four, I guess it was, um, full dress rehearsals, and then you just jump without a net. Yeah. That's what it's about. Yeah. So, you know, talking about Shanice and finding her, I know you weren't involved in that, but in the other movies, there, there are stars who are, the, the, the subject of the movie are larger than life. And here, you've got to find, now that Larry Sinitsky has hired you and you're, putting this together and you don't have three months of rehearsal. How did you find uh, Yaya DaCosta? What was that process like in terms of casting for you? Oh, well, um, it was like, let me, let's get a great uh, 
casting director and with Vicki Thomas. I had never worked with Vicki or been cast by her, but always her name was always like yeah. incredibly enamored of her and the work that she did. So um, my manager knew her, called her, and she I went to meet her, and she was like, you're going to start shooting in 18 days? You know, on the 18th? No, on the 18th. It's like, you're crazy. You're crazy. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. And she said, okay, I'll do it. I was talking with a dear friend of mine who's here, Di, and, you know, um, who is a director and, you know, like excited that I'm going to do this. And we start, we just start, you know, brainstorming about, about, about actresses, about who, who could do this, who could embody it, who could have that, you know, that regal quality, who could have that down, you know, that down girl from Newark, <laughs> you know, quality, um, and uh, came up with Yaya. And every, you know, the other names just sort of, you know, faded to the background, and she was the only one that I wanted. So I told, I told Vicky, Yaya lived in New York. Of course, I, you know, I'd watch, you know, America's Next Top Model. That's what she was known for. But I had also seen this little, this movie, indie movie, The Kids Are All Right, in which she was in. She played the girlfriend of Ruffalo right. or something. Right. And um, so I, I was, I was very familiar with her. And um, or familiar with her? No, very, because I watched that America's <laughs> Next Top Model. So yeah. she 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 came down to like the runner up, wow. you know. But beautiful girl, natural girl, you know. And uh, so we contacted, you know, New York to have her come, you know, to have her have her put on tape. A lot of girls came in from L.A., but I, I, you know, and it was just like, okay, I'm working with them, spending time with them, working, you know, we're working, you know, sometimes Vicky would read, and sometimes I just, I'd get up there with them, but I still wanted to see Yaya. And then the work, she put herself on tape, but the, but then, and, and soon she, you know, the tape arrived, okay, here it is, we're in the room, we're looking at it, they cut it, I think she said three words, and I, you know how they say, mm. drop the mic, bang, mm. <laughs> I said, see, that's it, she's the one. Mm. The very next day, we hear she's unavailable because she has a seri a to-go Netflix series you know, with the Wachowski brothers. That's another group of brothers yeah. <laughs> who could be in the room together. Right, exactly. yeah. right. You sure you and Kenny Leon are brothers? We're, we're actually going to adopt each other so that yeah. can be an established thing. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, the word was she was unavailable. So now I'm just absolutely, uh, you know, taking a, you know, and mm -hmm. as producer, oh, well, we have to go. And I was like, adamant, no. No, it's gonna be her. Uh, no, I'm a woman of faith. It is going to be her. I'm going to say my prayers tonight, and we just go on about all the other business that has to go on in these five weeks of prep, which yep. is very, very just like running and gunning in locations that are not working and can't find a ten acre house in Los Angeles and da 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 da, and calling up Catherine Bigelow and do you know someone and can you help me with this and she's trying to help and just just everyone was so helpful. And then one day I go in and I'm going to get my coffee. We're going to start one of these meetings. And the word comes that she called the Wachowski brothers and she asked, you know, if they would allow her, you know, allow her to step out so that she could come and do Whitney. And I fell on the ground. Prayer <laughs> answered. I said, you see, yeah. see. That's awesome. Prayer yeah. works. <laughs> Getting what you want, directing. Yeah. Yeah. And how with Kelly Garner and, and Marilyn, was it a similar I, story um, or? I saw I saw her in Bully. It was her first film, and I saw it when it came out in sometime in the 90s. Um, she was 15 years old, and she had a small part. Um, Heather, she has blue hair. And um, she gives this monologue in the back seat of the car after they kill the bully. And it just gave me goosebumps and chills and tear I mean it was a really intense story she told about her grandfather killing her grandmother and her mother reliving it when she'd get drunk it was really deep and oh, Kelly was just incredible in that movie I thought and I always said I was a film student when I watched it and I said I put it in my mind I'm, I'm gonna work with her I'm gonna work with that girl and um yeah and so then we were casting Marilyn a lot of you know a lot of young women came in and put themselves on tape a lot 
Um, you mean there are like a lot of attractive very, young women in Hollywood? For yes, that? everyone was very engaged with the process. And by everyone, I mean all the producers. And we'd have these meetings um, and make these lists night after night. And we worked with Carrie Barden and Paul Schnee, who are also incredible casting directors. They did Spotlight. They did Jessica Jones recently. They're, they're amazing. They anyway, um, so, but Kelly kept coming up in my mind. I kept going back to Kelly. I think she put herself on tape like three times and flew and did a you know second in-person audition with me in New York. Um, she read with Susan the last time. And then finally she was, it was a big appro approval process. Did Lifetime give you a hard time? Um, I wouldn't say they gave me a hard time, but you know they weren't sure the way I was right away. So... Yeah. They had someone else in mind, and I was very adamant, um, not only about Kelly, but I thought for Marilyn, there ne this actress needed to have certain physical features. Um, and the other girl is a very, very fine actress, but I just didn't think she could physically pull off Marilyn. Um, anyway, so. Yeah. But we... We landed on Kelly, and it worked out really well, and she had an acting coach on set, just like Marilyn. Just like Marilyn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was really helpful because she had to do, you know, it's the mannerisms and the voice, and, you know, she's Marilyn's very known, so, so yeah. she worked her ass off is what I'm saying. Yeah, well, you can see. Yeah. So, so Matthew, when you when you look at it and you see it now, it's on tape, it's no longer live, do you look back and think, oh, there's something I would do differently in the control room, shoot different shots, we missed that shot? Is there, you know, what, what kind of post-mortem do you do on it? Actually, I, I haven't watched it. I watched it back just to find which clip I was going to send in tonight, and otherwise right. I want to kind of forget it because then one day I can have fresh eyes. And when I was watching it just now, I had, there was a, there a close-up, there was a two-shot, and I thought, God, we're about ready for, oh, there it is, a wide shot, yeah. right? So I thought, well, maybe we worked hard enough to sort of get it right. Yeah. There's, <laughs> I always think that there's, you know, when you look at it, you let it go far enough away that you are fresh to it. That's when you can mm -hmm. learn. Because if you watch it the next day or the next week or the next month, you, you're still caught up in the drama yeah. of it. My idea is usually like five years later, you're in a hotel room, you're watching it on reruns, and you don't recognize it. <laughs> and then you go, oh, I should have done, oh, that was me. I, yeah. Yes, I should have thought of that question. But when, when you're in the control room, and now it's going live, and the world is watching it, do you know exactly which camera you're going to go to on each, for each shot, for each cut? Or are you suddenly inspired in the moment to go different? I do. I know there are directors who ad lib. I, I'm just not one of them. And I've never even seen another director in the booth since I was on that soap opera, you know, 100 years ago. I script it within an inch of its life. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, we take the entire script, all the songs. I read music um, so I can script. You know, every, once the music plays, everybody dances. Everybody. The, the dancers, the, the actors, the cameras, the shots. It all must be musical. And that's even true in the scenes mm -hmm. because there's a rhythm to life and there's a rhythm to every scene and you have to be there. Um, so we will script it and then we'll look at it and I take it, I look at it again and I change it so that by the time um, we are shooting it, everybody already knows what this is gonna, going to look at. And I rarely go off script. Once in a while, I do some um, some live directing for the Metropolitan Opera, for example. So a few times a year, I've gone live a lot, um, luckily. But every once in a while, I'll see something because uh, I'll see, and I'll ad lib something, and m my associate director and my TD are ready for it. But I don't think you're getting that much smarter in the moment. When I did tell you, think you can dance? The judging is all ad libbed. The dances were all scripted. So you kind of need those tools at your disposal. But yeah. So, so sorry, Angela. So, what would you, you know, now when you look back on it, though, right, it kind of what, what was, what was, in some way, the biggest challenge of this is thinking, how are we ever going to pull this off? Well, you know, in the movie, was there, what was that? How, how, how am I, when you read the script and when you started, how am I ever going to pull this off? Hmm. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there were, you know, every day had its new challenge. Every day was maybe shooting about six pages. You know, it was all new. You know, it was just all new. But I I really 
trusted my my DP. I had worked with him before on two films because I thought, you know, here I am, a newbie. It's my first time or whatever, and I didn't want my voice to be, you know, silenced. But I also, um, you know, made up my mind, you know, having worked with directors and which ones that I liked and who inspired me. And a lot of times we worked and it was, it was fast, it was quick, and might be independent and a little money. But somehow they didn't make me feel like it was fast and it was quick and we really had to get it done. But it, it made me feel like it was luxurious and I, I had the time. So I would have to remember, I would remember those experiences because I wanted my actors to feel that way. You know, I, I remember how directors made me feel that really got stuff out of me, you know. And um, so I wanted to be that for my actors. Um, some of the challenges were, I mean, we had 21 days to make it, you know, five days a week. We had these these three concert scenes and trying to make 10,000 people out of 150. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was really grateful to the, yeah, yeah, yeah right. you know. Um, uh, or the end of the night, the producer's saying, we're not going to get it. It's time to go, you know, and it's like DP, you know, it's feel like, okay, gorilla, let's go. Let's get in the car with a camera. Let's go. And then we get these, you know, and go, guys, you know, we get this wonderful scene in the, you know, just fun scene in the, in the limousine between the two of them. Or the opening scene, we don't have time. It was the end of a night at the shrine, and it was just taking forever. At one point, I ran in to fill in one of the spaces, just jumping in, <laughs> or whatever. Um, and um, it was like, let's go. And then, of course, he was just so upset with me at the end, but it's like... All right, sometimes you just have to take a bullet. Yeah. And the next day, yeah. it was all new yeah. and and it was great and we got it and we worked and we needed it. And um the I know you were you were asking me earlier about the the singing. I think it helped a lot that I had, you know, done a biopic where I sang, you know, played this iconic character. So a lot of that <laughs> was gone cuz I and 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 also played a lot of other characters, so you know, just how, how to delve into human psyche and these people and these historical figures, uh, you know, that I played in the past. But working with um, Deborah Cox, you know, who are we going to, I mean, I remember saying, who are we going to get to sing, who, you know, to sing for us? We can't, we can't use her seven, nine minute, you know, masters or whatever. We can't use them anyway. We have to redo them. And um, Dick Rudolph, was like our musical godfather. He would come by and just help us and give us insight. And we were, and I, and so we said, "Oh yeah, you know, oh yeah, that'll be easy. We'll find someone. They'll do that." And I remember looking at him like, "Who? Like I will knock you out. Who could sing like what? Who? Who? Like I dare you. I dare you to name a name of someone. Like please, I dare you." He said, "Deborah Cox." And I said, "Stop. I dare you to stop right now." because Deborah was is a friend of mine. So I was like, wait a minute, grab my phone. I was like, oh, thank you. It was as if things were just falling into place. And I called her, where are you in the world? And I think she was in Canada. And I said, y you heard about, I'm, I'm doing this thing, have you heard? No. I said, would you, you know, condescend to come and, and, and sing this part for me? Wow. And she, she w Whitney was her inspiration. She grew up, you know, just, Mm -hmm. idolizing her mm -hmm. she came we 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 did a we did a five songs four Whitney songs she came to LA for two days we had uh, this wonderful red one team we got in there she knocked out the first song in literally 25 minutes she sang Whitney's part every all the other parts she did it she did all four songs mm -hmm. in 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 the two days and the first one she finished in she finished it 30 minutes we used this in the movie Wow you know, yeah. and it was it was just like that. And then, of course, you know, the very last song, you know, knowing Whitney, knowing her background, it wasn't in the script. You know, her the faith that she that she possessed. She grew up in the church. Her first solo was in the church. Her mother was head of the the choir in the church, but that was nowhere in the in the script. Boop 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 boop. But. I know that's got that's a part of who she is, of how conflicted she is, you know, and um, I mean the, you know, the 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 secular and the faith, you know, all of that living in her. Um, so it was like 
Deborah, we've got to we've got to start the movie with the first song she ever sung in church. So here, I found her singing on YouTube in an interview on Arsenio, and she sings to him the first song she sang in church. So here it is. <laughs> Listen to that. Okay, just go and sing that. We may use that somewhere, and we end up, since we didn't shoot what was written, we end up using that just to play over, you know, the opening. And the last song, a lot of times in her concerts, she would ingest those gospel runs because that's something that was so special about her voice and, and how she got us, you know, and that was a big part of her. So it's like, you got to stop the song as it's going, you know, the you know, Dolly Parton song, and we've got to put a little of that in it, you know. Mm, you know, the yeah. life's falling apart, you know, she's got to, she needs help, you know, God's help. Um, and so um, that was just ways of, you know, what you know about the characters, not in the script, but trying to layer it because, you know, it's important to who that person is and who gets it, gets it, and who doesn't, yeah. you know. And Laura, the I same. felt that in, yeah. your, in the song that we saw, Her Gospel Passed. It was there for sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I know we're getting late on time, but L Lori and, and Matt, oh, just that same our, chat question. Our biggest about. challenge was um, hair makeup because oh, so whole... <laughs> okay, so Kelly had seven different hair looks. It was a cradle-to-grave biopic. Um, so she has to start off as Norma Jean. Um, all you Marilyn of Files know that Norma Jean had very thick, dark, curly hair and then went through phases. She went through the honey golden brown, the short honey golden brown, the uh, you know the regular blonde, and she had pearly white. We, the, Cleona Fury, who was nominated for an Emmy, Emmy for the hair work mm -hmm. in the show, um, had names for all the wigs, and then some of the wigs had extensions. So I think there were four main wigs, and three of them had extensions. Each hair change took, minimum of an hour and each makeup change took minimum of an hour so if she had a hair and makeup change usually they go together that's two hours so if we have one day on the schedule which we had a few where there are two or three hair and makeup changes and you can't do any overtime the schedule becomes this beast right no to question to conquer and we did we did it. I mean, I think we went overtime two or three days. We had a 42-day shoot because it was a four-hour miniseries. Um, and that, I have to say, across the board was the biggest challenge for yeah. us on the show, yeah. Yeah, Matthew, and, and the biggest challenge in the... Uh, I think the, the biggest challenge for us, uh, technically, because we had an amazing cast, Kenny's a tremendous director, um, the set itself, which were these LED screens, and the moment I saw them, I called Derek McLean, who is freaking brilliant. And I said, they're great, but the moment I shoot from the side, I'm going to be seeing a lot of Teamsters eating jelly donuts, a couple of DGA members checking their residuals. So what are you going to do for me? Because this flat master isn't going to work for an entire three hours. Um, and he called back you know, the next day and he went, I've got an idea. We're going to just put them on gimbals and we're going to pivot them. And so turning them, taking them, things that go off stage, shooting away from that, et cetera, was a nonstop event, getting it loaded that way, and then we had 50 people or whatever it was, 50 or 60 people in the cast, most of whom, oddly enough, didn't have any television experience. So that was its own kettle of fish. Yeah. I already mentioned Shanice, who's brilliant, but such a, you know, such a neophyte that you're going, no, 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 don't lean like this, lean like this. Well, the craft of acting is, you know, extraordinary. Um, and then there were just some, some issues to wrestle. Somebody asked me the other day what I, what I thought was the most difficult thing to decide. And it was the, the tornado scene. Like, how do you, it's not a real tornado. Obviously, we get to a real tornado. On, I mean, that, it looks like a boiler room, and it looks like they're taking off their clothes, and it looks like they're free again, and they're dancing and singing. The tornado? It's, I mean, it's dancers playing a tornado. There's not a spot of wind there. So we threw in a, lots of things that nobody I felt had ever quite done that way. Dutch angles and swish pans and getting up to the LED screens. And then they said, oh, that's great, but you know, Shanice has got to wear a harness starting from the beginning of the show. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a really good idea. Our star, yeah. Yeah. who's going to first sing the most gorgeous song with Stephanie, um, Stephanie is going to wear a harness? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. And everybody goes like this. I said, wait a second. I've already worked out getting her off camera. Let's just bring her back as a double. So our associate choreographer, um, Charm, was her double. So she's flying. So 
But I look at all that stuff. Nobody would quite have packed all that into um, a three minute or two minute or whatever that is. So um, we've got this extraordinary team of cameramen and sound people. That's her double flying? That's her double fly. That's yeah. her double fly. What we caught. I mean, Shanice makes. was completely. She was completely disappointed. She wanted to fly, but it means you've got to wear this harness that makes you look like. You think the camera adds, adds ten pounds? Try being in Cirque du Soleil. Yeah. Okay, that. So um, it was. It was all that kind of stuff, dovetailing slowly yeah. but surely. Great. Well, we're just about out of time. But are there any questions from the audience before we uh, retreat to the uh, reception? Any questions? Yes. No. Nothing. Directors who are intimidated. Oh my we god! We had bad hair Shocked, problems I too. Tell you. Yeah. We had hair problems too, and I remember going through the entire script and because you know all the different hair and looks that Whitney wore, but also Bobby during that time with the Gumby, you know, <laughs> and 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 I remember oh we went through the you know the makeup test and was like oh great great oh that's perfect that's perfect then you get to the first day and it's like oh I cut the Gumby up. <gasps> What? You know, and I went through the script and I drew a little picture of her. Her I want her hair like this, a page for then this one I want the long one, and then his is a gumby now. But then y yeah, you know, yeah. people get so confused. You yeah, know, and we, we and had to have a full um script breakdown meeting, me, makeup and hair. I'd never done that before. Yeah. But in prep we broke down ev every, every single, single one. scene. Then we, we lost our late, hair guy. People and stayed late. The, they worked into the, the, the light went on and her hair started. And we smoking. only had to put David Allen smoking. Greer. <laughs> we only had to put David Allen Greer in a full full oh. hair bodysuit. Yeah. So I mean, that was its own. It took two hours the first time. I think he yeah. had twelve oh, minutes yeah. eventually. Yeah. Well, that, that's why. Oh, wow. You, uh, I mean, he got something it down. like that. Well, by the time he leaves he as better, the farmhand yeah. and comes back yeah, as the lion, I mean, it might have been you know eighteen minutes, but. It's, well, it's that, always the same choreographer as you had. Oh, Fatima, Fatima. she's, yeah, she's an amazing choreographer, choreographer yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's why you got into directing because of the hair and makeup stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I just wanted to say one thing about my DP. I worked with Chris Manley, who was also nominated for an Emmy for his work on the show. He um, shot seven seasons of Mad Men. That's his um, one of his claims to fame, and he taught me a lot of tricks about what you do when you start running out of time. For example, if there's a shot you really want to get and it's one of those time-consuming shots, you have you set that up, you have it up on the monitor for everyone to see, you know, waiting, because we had a few cameras, two cameras. Do we have three? Two. Just little, little tricks of the trade, and, and that really helped, like Angela said, working with someone more experienced, because I, you know, don't have as much, so. Well, anyway. I think that un unless there are any questions, I think that's sort of a, an excellent place to um, to conclude because, you know, just hearing you guys, it's it's really extraordinary the amount of uh, meticulous, caring preparation work that led to all the inspiration that's that's in these movies and that you see in these these great performances and the the real life on. Uh, on film there. So, you know, terrific work. And uh, I think we'll have a little reception now. So, great. Awesome. Thank you. Hey,